In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My beloved, today the reading of the Holy Gospel comes to us from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. And it is a very similar passage to the same passage that was read just last Sunday from the Gospel of St. Luke. And the passage that we just finished reading is the parable of the sower. And how it is that the Lord explains to the multitudes who are sitting and listening to him about how it is a sower went out to sow and he threw seeds everywhere he could. Now we're all very familiar with how it is that the Lord explains what the meaning of every single types of these grounds are. He explains what the wayside is. He explains what the thorny ground is. He explains what the rocky ground is. But there is something that we are called to meditate on that we must absolutely bring to the forefront of the conversation that we want to have today. We have to talk about the human heart that is supposed to be that earth that receives. There is a very peculiar thing about the word earth. In the original Hebrew, the way that they described humility was by using the word earth. And so to say that someone was humble in the ancient Hebrew language was to declare that they were like the earth. Why is that? Why would the word that describes humility be the exact same word that is used to describe the earth that we walk on? Why is it that the earth which we walk on would be the very thing that we try to use to describe what it means for a person's heart to be humble? You see, the earth is something that is very unique. The earth is something that receives. It does nothing on its own. The earth is something that everyone walks upon. The earth is at the mercy of those who cultivate it. And the earth is capable of producing wonderful things, but the earth is also capable of being filled with things that can harm others. The, fir the earth can be something that is firm and grows hard, and that becomes almost as hard as concrete, but it can also be an earth that is willing to receive if cultivated properly. To declare that someone is humble is to declare that they are like the earth, that they are at the mercy of those who surround them, that they are only willing to receive and that they have no will of their own. They have no desire to think of themselves, but rather only to be at the mercy of those that they receive from. You see, the heart is like this. The human heart which was given by God to the human being was intended in order for it to have the potential of doing great things but it also has the potential to be able to harbor within it very evil and dark things. But the heart is at the mercy of the human will. The heart is at the mercy of whatever it is that we want to happen within that heart. And when we speak of heart in the church and when the scripture speaks of the heart of the human being, it is not speaking of the organ. It is not speaking of the biological, physiological heart. What is it speaking of? the center of the human being. It is speaking of that place which harbors the soul, that place where your identity is found. That is the center of the human being. That is the heart that we speak of when we say that God dwells within the heart of every human being. But the heart of the human being is truly a mysterious thing. Because what do we do with that heart? That same heart is capable of harboring so much love, and yet it can also harbor so much hatred. It could harbor so much compassion, but it can also harbor so much resentment. Some hearts are capable of forgiving, and some hearts are never willing to forget the sins of others. The heart is not the problem. The heart is like the earth. It cannot be blamed for anything. The earth in and of itself is neither evil nor is it good. The earth only produces what you place in it. The earth only brings about those things that you provoked it to bring out. The same earth, if neglected, will grow weeds, will grow thorns, will grow thistles. But if cared for, if cultivated, if loved, 
It will bring about a garden and flowers which very scent will fill the entire area and bring everyone's eyes to look upon its beauty. The earth is not the problem. The earth is not what's at the focus of this. It's what we place in that earth and how we deal with it. The Lord is speaking this parable and He's telling you and me, what are you doing with the earth that was granted to you? What are you doing with the human heart that was granted to you? And what are you cultivating within it? I was speaking to one of the children of God just recently and they were talking to me about how it is that they were in a place where there was a beautiful garden. A beautiful garden right next to the water that has a variety of different flowers and the flowers were so beautiful to look at and the very scent of the garden filled the air so much that it just added to the beauty of everything that was around it. But for any of you who have ever worked in a garden, does this kind of beauty happen haphazardly? Is this kind of beauty manifested all by itself? Or is this kind of beauty provoked by someone getting on their knees, dirtying their hands, removing the stones, cultivating the ground, making sure to till it? If there are thorns, if there are insects, if there are wild beasts that would threaten the beauty and the health of that garden, are all of these things not thought of? by the person who is the gardener, the person who is willing to take care of that land. We walk in front of something beautiful and we say, I wish I had that in my home. We walk in front of another person's yard and we say, I wish my yard would look at this. Have you ever heard someone say the idea of the grass is greener on the other side? Have you heard of the saying where people will think that the grass is always greener wherever they are not. So what does this say about you and me? Is the grass greener somewhere else or is the garden more beautiful? Are the flowers budding more powerfully and more beautifully somewhere else just because God wants to be able to provoke within me an envy, a jealousy? This beauty cannot be found unless someone is willing to put in the work. The problem is not the earth. The earth that is found on my neighbor's lawn is the exact same earth that is found on mine. But is it possible that the earth that I am called to take care of requires work, requires for me to get down on my knees, requires for me to get my hands dirty, to put in effort, requires for me maybe even to remove everything that is there and to restart completely anew, to replant, to restart to build as if what I was doing had to be completely replacing that which was there before. What am I doing with the earth that was given to me? The heart is like this. The heart is a place that will produce whatever you want it to. If left neglected, then the heart will grow cold. And as the heart grows cold, it grows harder. And as it grows harder, it becomes like the wayside which is mentioned here in Scripture. Then he spoke to many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. The wayside is the place where most people walk. If you've ever walked on a trail before, a trail is oftentimes hardened because of how many people have passed back and forth on it. That ground was never that hard. It used to be soft. It used to be able to produce fruit. It used to be able to grow trees and grass and beautiful things. But because it has been stepped on so often, it has become compact. Because it has been compacted by the weight of people stepping on it over and over and over again, it is no longer capable of receiving. So when you throw something on it, what happens? It doesn't sink inside. The ground is not capable of receiving the seed that is thrown on it. It just stays there on the surface. It never enters into the ground. The earth is not capable of receiving it. So what happens? That seed that is thrown, the birds see it. The seed is no longer hidden within the earth. 
And so when the birds see it, they come and they devour it. And the seed is no more. And the earth remains hard. Is it possible that the heart that has been granted to me, I have trampled down on it? Is it possible that I have allowed the world and all of its evil to walk all over my heart so much that I have not taken care of it and it has just grown hard? And now no matter what God tries to plant within my heart, seeds of mercy, seeds of love, seeds of thanksgiving, seeds of virtue, my heart is not capable of receiving it. That the seed that God tries to plant in me simply stays at the surface and at the first sign of any turmoil, of any sort of situation that distracts me, the seed that he is trying to plant is removed. There are other kinds of hearts. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. There are some earths that when you look at them, they look beautiful at the surface. They look beautiful at the surface because when you look at them, you can't tell what's underneath them. But on the front, on the top, it's dark, it's rich, it looks like it's earth that is ready to receive. But as soon as you begin to go in, you immediately hit stones, you immediately hit rocks. So what happens? There's no depth. So when you try to plant something, as soon as you plant the seed, what is the first thing that happens with the seed? It begins to spread its roots. And as it spreads its roots, it begins to move downward, deeper, into the depth of the earth in order to be nourished and to grow. But when this seed is planted and it tries to spread its roots, what happens? It hits the stones. It hits the rocks. The roots have nowhere to go. And so instead of moving downwards into the depth of the earth, it pushes itself up and it dies. Is it possible that there are stones, there are major events, there are passions, there are sins, there are addictions that lie hidden beneath in my heart that even though God plants things and I want to receive it, I want to receive it, is it possible that there is no depth? That the movement within my heart is one where I really want to, but it lasts for a week, for a month, for a little period, but it doesn't remain. It doesn't remain because of the things that remain in my life that force me to constantly just go back to my habits because there is no depth. There's a third kind of heart. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up, and they choked them. It's interesting to speak about thorns, because thorns are not hidden deep within the earth. Where do thorns strive? Right above the earth. Right above the earth. So if you throw a seed in a thorny place, the seed is so small that it could find its way to the earth. And the earth underneath it can still be very good. And so what happens? The seed enters into the earth and it begins to spread its roots and it begins to grow. And it's wonderful. It's happy because it thinks that finally it's going to have a little bit of growth. It will be able to show its beauty. But as soon as it begins to grow, it immediately faces adversity. It immediately finds itself surrounded by thorns. And so now this is a heart that even though the heart is good, and even though the heart is willing, the heart is dependent on all of its external realities. The things outside of the heart are capable of influencing whether or not the heart is capable of producing fruit. Lord, I want to, but work is so difficult. Lord, I want to, but my financial situation is too impossible to deal with. Lord, I want to, but my family and their needs. I can't give up my responsibilities towards them to focus on you. And I find external situations, thorns, that choke whatever good can be produced in my heart. We have to go back and recognize 
that the only earth that is capable of receiving is the earth that has been taken care of. The heart where the stones have been removed. The heart that it has been hardened, it has been cultivated and tilled and broken down until finally it could receive seed. The heart that if it is surrounded by thorns, the thorns are removed. Remember the image of the person walking next to the garden. The flowers, the decorations, the beauty of the garden. None of this is accidental. None of this is accidental. That garden only exists because someone has struggled, because someone has put in the effort. So what do I do? I go back to God and I tell Him, Lord, I want to be your garden. Lord, I want you to work on my heart. Lord, I want to be a flower for you. I want the beauty that people see in me, that they give glory to you because you have allowed me to become this beautiful thing. And then I stop there. And this is my mistake. All too often I have gone to God and I have said, I want, I want, I want, I wish, I wish, I wish. Where is the action? There is no difference between me and the person who looks at his neighbor and who says, I wish my grass was as green as yours. So do you really think that just because you wished that your grass was as green as your neighbor's, that suddenly your grass was going to become as green as his? Do you think that because you turned to God and you said, Lord, I want to be a beautiful garden for you. Lord, I want my heart to be good earth. You think this is now suddenly going to transform your heart? I want to bring you back to another parable. A parable in Luke 15 where there is a son who betrays his father. And when he betrays his father, he tells him, you are dead to me, give me the inheritance that you are supposed to give me when you die, and I want nothing to do with you. And the prodigal son goes and lives his life, and he wastes everything that was given to him. And then he finds himself finally working on a pig farm. And as he works on the pig farm, he realizes that even the pigs are treated better than him. And he comes to his senses and he realizes that even the servants in his father's home have more than enough to eat and to spare, but he's dying of hunger. So what does he say? He thinks to himself and he says, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. What is happening here inside the heart of the human being? He's preparing his repentance. He's preparing the change. He says, I will, I want to, I wish, I desire, and I hope that I will. This is wonderful. Do you think the parable ends there? What would happen if the parable ended there? What would happen if the parable ended with the son saying, I will arise and go to my father? So what actually happens? We would have no idea. The problem is not in wishing to change. Many of us desire to change, but how many of us are willing to embrace the change that comes with it? All of us want beautiful gardens, Habibi. There isn't a single human being that if you offer to them that their heart becomes something beautiful, Everyone wants that. But how many of us are willing to get down on our knees and work? How many of us are willing to go from, I hope, I wish, I want, to the actual action of getting up, of putting on the appropriate gear, of going outside, getting on our knees, and getting our hands dirty? What's beautiful about the parable of the prodigal son is that he doesn't simply say, I will arise and go to my father. St. Luke says that he arose and he began his way back. He did it. He didn't simply wish it. He didn't simply say, I would like to. He did it. There has to be a moment in my life where I stop staring at the neighbor's grass but that I actually go have a conversation with the neighbor. And I ask him, 
What are you doing? What are you doing so that I can learn from you? What are you doing so that I can imitate you? What are you doing so that I can have beautiful grass just as yours? And this is the beauty of the church. This is the beauty of how in the body of Christ we come together and we can learn from one another. That every single liturgy we are capable of reading from the lives of those whose grass is greener. That we are capable of coming to the saints and hearing their stories and finding out their secrets of what it is that they have done so that we can have gardens as beautiful as theirs. If you go back to the church, right underneath the icon of St. George, there is the relics of holy men and women. Relics of holy men and women whose gardens were absolutely stunning whose gardens were filled with flowers that released a scent that filled the heavens. All you have to do is ask them what they did. There is no difference between us and them. Every single one of us can have a garden as beautiful as theirs. And Lord, forgive me, maybe even more beautiful than theirs. But it is up to us to not only want it, we must put in the effort. But this is the problem. The problem is that when I begin to think of the work that has to be done, what happens? This gets in the way. Because what does this do? It tells me, Taib, okay. If you're going to do this, what does this look like? Do you have the time? Do you have the energy? Do you have the money? What's going to get in the way? Doesn't it depend on the weather? Doesn't it depend on your circumstances? Doesn't it depend on whether or not people will leave you alone? Are you sure you're capable of starting this? Go ahead, do it. But why don't you start it at a time that is more convenient? Why not wait for instance this summer? Because this summer, the kids are in camp, the kids are doing this, the wife is at work, you have more time for yourself, then you can begin your journey. But let's start planning. And you start thinking and overthinking and you begin to challenge yourself. And so you decide, maybe the best thing for me to do right now is to stare at my neighbor's grass. Let me keep my eyes on my neighbor's grass so I don't forget that I want to change mine. And I convince myself that it's not the right time, that the circumstances don't allow it, and that maybe, maybe this isn't for me. There is a point in a person's life, especially in the Christian life, where we have to stop moving in our lives based on this. And we have to be led by this. And if the heart says change is required, begin the change. Begin the change. Do not worry about tomorrow. Do what you can today. Okay, I'm going to begin fasting next week. We actually begin fasting next week. I'm going to begin fasting next week. I want to start fasting. I want this kind of change. I want this fast to purify me. So what do I say? I will go ahead and begin next week. And then I come next Wednesday. And what happens? I'm not ready. I didn't go shopping. It's a work day tomorrow. The kids are not ready. I haven't even prepared them. This is going to get complicated. Let's begin next Monday. Beginning of the new week, fresh. This weekend, I'll go shopping. That weekend, something happens. It's someone's birthday. There's an event. You get occupied. You don't go shopping. So what do you say? Ah, I had the intention to. I wanted to. I had planned to. Everything was moving in the right direction. But circumstances didn't allow it. So what do you do? Taib, let me see if I can maybe start sometime this week. Worst case scenario, next Monday. Does this sound familiar to anyone? If not, that's wonderful. Maybe you're nothing like me, but I'm telling you what happens to me. At some point I have to stop and I have to say, I will start. I will begin. I will get down on my knees and I will dig. And if I find rocks, I will throw them out. And if I find thorns, I will remove them. And if I find ground that is hard, I will begin to dig into that ground and cultivate it and till it until finally it is ready to receive the seed. 
until finally it is ready to grow forth a garden that is worthy of the glory of God. The calling that we have today is not only to desire a beautiful garden. The calling that we have today is to begin putting in the work so that every single one of us can become that garden. To recognize that it's not enough that we stare at our neighbor and that we stare at the icons of the saints that surround us and to think, look how beautiful they are. I could only wish. Habibi, stop wishing. Christianity is not about wishing. Christianity is not about desiring. Christianity is not about sitting there and praying that it happens accidentally. Christianity has to be the very life that we live which allows us to move towards that goal of becoming beautiful. And may He grant us to be that beautiful garden for Him. May He grant us to break down the hard ground. May He grant us the courage and the strength to remove the rocks and to remove the thorns. And may He plant His seed so that every one of us can show forth the beauty that is worthy of His name. To Him be all glory now and forever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen. <laughs> Oh, in all